Hey guys, Pastor Adam. Pray that this sermon resource is a blessing to you as you seek to study and know more about the Lord Jesus. One quick thing before we get into it. I pray that you would come to a place where you find belonging at a local church. Watching sermon content online is awesome, but it is not a substitute for being part of a body of believers. So if you're local to West Michigan, the Noego County area, I would love to see you and your family here at Second Church. If you're not local, I pray that you'd find yourself a home where you can belong and study God's word in community. That's more important than I can stress. And so now that I've stressed it, let's get into today's message. So we've been digesting the first chapter of Jonah for a couple of weeks now. We've been through his call, we've been through his disobedience, we've been through arguments with sailors who would probably rather kill him but aren't sure if that's the right move, which if we can be honest, like any time a group of people want to kill you, you're hoping it's the wrong move. And we've been through Jonah realizing, yeah, they should probably kill me because I'm the problem. Is that that Taylor Swift song? I don't know. If that is, high schoolers, you can fact check me, it's me, I'm the problem. Is that Taylor Swift? Jonah has a swifty moment. I couldn't help it, I'm sorry. So then today we get to the part of Jonah that everyone knows. This is the day he gets eaten by a fish. Typically when we think of Jonah, we go right to that as if it's the first line. We open the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and he said, oh no, a fish. And so my hope is that as we've studied so far, you've encountered a little bit of the, the turmoil that Jonah finds himself in because he, he's a prophet and we often put them sort of pedestal is is like the holy ones of Israel. But actually, Jonah, even though he has that job, is maybe not living into it quite as much. <clears throat> so, as we talk about Jonah's undeserving life, it's a reflection of our undeserving life. And yet, God gives us his grace anyway. I've titled the sermon this morning, An Unlikely Vessel for Undeserved Grace. And You'll see in the story, the unlikely vessel for Jonah is a giant fish. Often we say Jonah and the whale because, I mean, what other giant fish is there? The Bible doesn't say whale, it says fish, and so I'm going to call it a fish, you can call it a whale. I don't know, could have been a sea monster for all I know, the Bible doesn't say. But it was big enough to swallow him whole. And I imagine as he's falling over this giant ship into the water, and then it says, the Lord provided a fish. His first thought probably wasn't, I'm saved. It's an unlikely vessel. It is a thing that Jonah wasn't planning on, that Jonah wasn't expecting. And I'd like to open with just a quick story about the unlikely vessel in my life. And I hope that this translates. And so if it doesn't, I apologize in advance for adding to the sermon when it wasn't necessary. But my, my unlikely vessel was a Toyota Tundra. My, my apologies for the number of times I'm about to make fun of that truck if you own one. I, I don't dislike you. I dislike your vehicle. And you're just going to have to be okay with that. Uh, because I was hit by one. It was on a lift kit. It had really big mud tires. It didn't need them. There weren't dirt roads in Port St. Lucie, but it had them. And it ran smack into the little Kia I was driving. No judgment, please. Uh, so just right into the back of me. Um, at the time... My career was awesome. Um, I was like raking in the money. I was developing this little bit of like a fame thing for myself. I traveled the country. I was doing hair. Don't, don't judge that either. It's a weird day for my hair. It was sticking up in the back. Um, but that's what I did, and I was really, really good at it. Um, but I also lived a life that was not, I wasn't a believer, and I lived a life that not only was not honoring of God, but I imagine if God were a little more sarcastic than he probably was, he'd have words for me. Um, at the time, because of the industry that I had wrapped myself into, my children and I were sort of estranged. I didn't know them. I lived with them, but we weren't close. We didn't spend time together. Uh, my wife and I were essentially roommates. Um, everything was sort of falling apart, but man, was I really good at my job. And so that's sort of what I clung to. Um, at the time, uh, my wife and I, I think, I don't necessarily speak for her, but I imagine she was in the same place that I was, that we were both just sort of waiting for the other one to say divorce. Like, that's where we were. And then I got hit by a truck. And in the story of Jonah, he gets eaten by a fish, and we, we've read the Bible a little bit, so we know the fish is the place in which he repents from his. But I wasn't a believer, and so I got hit by a truck, and my first thought was not, oh, praise God, I'm still alive. My first thought was, really? 
I'm not even going to get to work today, and now I need to fix my car that I don't even like, and I get hit by a truck that I now don't like. Today is not a good day. It was an unlikely vessel, and the reason I call it that is over the next several weeks and months, the, the world looked a little different for me because I had a back injury, and so I couldn't do my job as a hairdresser. Um, I did it a little bit, but like I couldn't, it wasn't the way that it was before. I couldn't stand for eight hours. I couldn't travel like I was, and so things had to sort of change. And after about a year or so, I was kind of getting back to a place where I was like, I can return to normal. I can get back to doing hair. And, and my marriage was still a complete disaster, and my kids and I were still not close. And Delilah was a baby at the time, and I held her sometimes. And it was just not, it was not great, but I was about to get back to work. You know what happened? I was in a rear-end collision a second time. And you'll never guess what the car was that hit me. It was a lifted with mud tires Toyota Tundra. In fact, different driver, same color. As if God was saying, hey, did you not hear me the first time? And again, not a believer, right? So I was like, seriously? This time, the car was okay, but I was not. Actually, this time, my whole family was in the car, whereas the first time, it was just me. My whole family was in the car. Everyone was fine except me, because remember, previous back injury, right? So jostled by a truck, and suddenly life was like a disaster again. And I was like, what is happening? And so I borrowed some money from my mom, and I, I bought a car as a replacement so that I had, we had two vehicles again, because now that I had the second back injury, the way that I was getting to and from work wouldn't work anymore. I was riding a motorcycle super safe. Um, and so I borrowed money from my mom, and I bought a vehicle that I thought was just going to be great for us. And then on 26th of December that vehicle, while we were driving 80 miles an hour down the highway to visit my grandmother, proved it was not the purchase I thought it was, and a tire exploded um, on the highway. Everyone was fine, for the record. We, did, we spun a few times. We slid off to the side of the road. Semis were, like, mad at me, but nobody hit us. And at that moment, I realized something is off in my life. I'm running from something, but again, not a believer. And so that night... I was sitting on my kitchen counter. Everyone had gone to bed. And I thought to myself, what is happening? Like, I was doing okay. I was providing for my family. I mean, I wasn't like, I wasn't the dad they needed or the husband she needed, but I was, I mean, they ate. They had clothes. Our house was paid for. What am I doing? And I had this realization that the only thing I hadn't tried, I did a lot of like bootstrap pulling up. I did a lot of like, I'm going to fix it. And none of it ever seemed to work. And in that moment, I realized the only thing I hadn't tried yet, I had not tried Jesus. And so, just like Jonah, this unlikely moment that happened to me twice, fortunately, Jonah gets eaten once and he figures it out. I got hit by the same truck, essentially, two times for God to finally say, hey, bro, I don't think he talks that way, but in my head he does. Trying to get your attention, pay attention. I want more for you. There is a, a thing that you need to do that you are not doing. And so that's what we're going to discover happens to Jonah this morning. And I want you to think about if there was maybe a moment or a vessel in your life that, that has taken you and turned your life back to Jesus. And we're going to come back to that at the end. So whether or not you loved that story, I apologize. You're going to have to hear it twice. So... With that said, we're going to be in the first chapter of Jonah for this last week. We're actually, this is the first time we've read every single verse from a chapter, and so I've loved it. Hopefully you have too, but we're going to be in Jonah beginning in chapter 1, verse 13. If you have a Bible, please get it out and turn to Jonah chapter 1. If you don't, there are Bibles in the pews around you or on your phone. You can probably find it. Google's really great at finding things for you, but I would encourage you to have the text in front of you as we go through it because, as I say every week, this is the center of of the service. This is the reason we gather. God's word is the most important thing in our lives today and tomorrow and yesterday, always. And so have it so that you can refer back to it, because I'm going to, and I think it would really be a value to us if you could see God speaking. Um, we have a tendency in our culture to get bogged down by all of the noise, and so by having it open, it makes it much easier to hear from him, because he does speak to us today through his word. And so I encourage you to have it open. Before we read it, though, I'd like to go to God in prayer once more. Would you lift your hearts with me, and we're going to speak to Jesus. Father in heaven, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we thank you that in your triunity, you added to your love by creating us. 
And we thank you that through Jesus, we are able to reunite in that relationship and know you in a special way. And we thank you that you've given us this revelation, this book that we can read from and know who you are better. And we ask that you would open our eyes this morning and open our ears this morning so that the message you have for us through the book of Jonah would be clear and that we would see you and experience you in a new way this morning. Quicken our hearts to want more of you and less of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beginning in verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah... And threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. It's a long time to be inside a fish. It's a long time to be around fish. I don't know if you guys are fishermen, but if you've ever been stood next to a live fish, there's like a, a fragrance. There's some giggles, and so you know what I'm talking about. He was inside that fragrance for three days. And so I don't want you to think as I talk about the grace that this fish provided that it was just the best thing that ever happened to him, because it was probably quite awful. I mean, I'm in a fish. It smells terrible. I wonder sort of like what the environment was like, right? Because he's in the stomach of this thing. You wonder to yourself, like, are there, like, other little fish parts? Are there other people, perhaps, that this fish has eaten? Or is it just, like, dark and quiet? Can you maybe hear, like, the whale's heartbeat? So, like, don't, don't get me wrong. When I say undeserved grace from an, an unlikely vessel, my, my, my hope is that you don't hear me saying God's going to swoop in and make everything awesome. Because I don't think Jonah looked at it that way. And I don't think you should look at it that way either. But what he does do is provide for us a way in which to know that no matter what, he's in the driver's seat. You ever seen that bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? My apologies, because I'm about to make fun of it. So if it's on your car, I'm sorry. But he's not your co-pilot. He's not helping you figure your life out. God is in control, and you're like behind him, like trying to figure out how to walk the way he walks. It's like when you see like a mother with her ducklings and the ducklings are like wobbling around and the mom's just like straight as an arrow. We're the ducklings. We're not the duck. We're the ducklings. And so as we discover what this unlikely vessel did for Jonah, don't get lost in the idea that something happens to you and suddenly you've got your life figured out. That is a lie that a lot of people outside of the Christian faith believe that if you're a Christian, you've got it figured out. And so all of us are just hypocrites because we know the right way and we just don't do it. And on the one hand, we're all hypocrites because we do know the right way. On the other hand, we're not capable of living that way. And so God has these vessels, these unlikely ways in which to point us back to him. And that is the experience that we have of him this morning. I think there's maybe four things to talk about as we unpack the text. Independence, obedience, reverence, and deliverance. I'm not going to lie, I was really proud of that because they all sort of ended the same. And I don't know why, but it just felt really good coming out of my mouth. I was like, man, something satisfying about that. It's a weird day. I'm in a good mood. I'm sorry, guys. So anyway, we're going to talk about independence first. Let's look back at verse 13. It starts off instead. And so that means that there was something we should probably already know. So remember how we ended last week, verse 12. It says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that the great storm has come upon you. That's verse 12. That's Jonah saying, hey, guys, here's your solution. I'm the problem. God is mad in the ocean. Like, throw me overboard. But even though everybody acknowledges, everybody on the boat says, oh, it's Jonah's God who we don't worship. Jonah has the plan. Instead is how this next verse starts. Like, if it were me and my life is about to end, and somebody says, hey, here's the solve, I'm doing what that guy says, not these guys. So in the independence of man, the sailors have a different plan. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. 
why not just do the thing? Like, this guy is a man of God. He says, I, I speak to God. I'm a prophet. This is what you have to do. Why not just listen? Like, why not? I don't get it. And I think what we can learn from that, have you ever, like, looked out at the world and you just see such an obvious solution? You, you're just like, hey, you know, if you would just, like, can you just hear me talk about Jesus for a minute and, like, your life would change? Like, you, won't, you wouldn't struggle the way that you're struggling now because you would believe that there's a hope and a future? Like, have you ever had that thought, talking to somebody who's just a mess, but they're, like, an atheist or they believe something other than you? That's, like, I think what was happening probably in that moment for Jonah. He was just like, guys, would you just listen? Which is ironic because what he said was, throw me overboard. But I imagine that was Jonah's moment. He's like, hey, here's the plan. And they're like, nope, we're going to row. We're just going to, we're going to do it. And Jonah probably was like, guys, would you just kill me? Which is weird. But so I think what it does is it shows us there are two very real ways in which we can follow Jesus or that we can live our lives. We can sort of do it man's way or we can do it God's way. So in this passage, you have Jonah who says, here is God's way. I'm the problem. It's me. Throw me overboard. And then you have all of these sailors who, remember we talked last week, they have a different God. They don't even all have the same God in common. They have different Elohims, different little G gods. And so they're all just like, we're going to solve this. But then Jonah, capital G, his God has a plan. But, but they have this own, their own little way. They're like, nope, but we've got life figured out. And I think we all probably know people like that, or we've seen people on TV like that, or read about people like that in books. Hopefully, there's at least one person in your life who's kind of like that. And the reason I say hopefully is that means you have a perfect opportunity to talk to them about the other kind of way. But if you look at man's way, that's what verse 13 is. Verse 13, which we just read, is, is an obvious example of the way the world operates, the way that people outside of the love of Jesus operate. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then the world says, yeah, you know what, though? I just want to, like, spend all the money that I earn on reckless things and just take advantage of people and make things all about me. That's, that's, I think that's a good plan. And so as we think about what man's way does for the world, you end up seeing things like the, the fighting in Israel this morning is because people don't want to just, like, love their neighbor as themselves, which is perhaps an oversimplification of the very damaging things that happen. But if you really think about it, because of sin, if you don't have Jesus to pull you out of the sin spiral that we just have a tendency as people to fall into, that you just, you just do what makes sense in your own eyes. That happens like six or eight times in the book of Judges. And people did what was right in their own eyes. Can you imagine if everybody did that? Well, in my eyes, I think I'm just going to sleep all day. But I, there's probably at least a couple people who are like, well, in my eyes, I'm going to punch you in the neck. It would make for a really complicated afternoon. And so it can't be man's way. And so when we get clear direction from God, it can't be that we just say, that sounds great, but like, let's go this way. Let's row towards the shore because it's not, it's not gonna work. So it can't be man's way. But what I want you to see is that the reason that happens is because man outside of Christ is an enemy of God which is maybe an aggressive way to put it, but that's the Bible, so don't be mad at me. Just, you'll find it. Man in his natural state, humankind without Jesus, is an enemy of the Lord. And so it only makes sense that as an enemy, we would do the opposite. We would fight against him. We would move away from him. And what's interesting to me is that God loves even his enemies. In fact, that's even advice that we're given. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But how do you live into that? Well, you have to recognize that moving against him, even in that, he's still like honoring what it is that you're doing. This is going to sound weird. You're going to need to go with me for a minute. So everybody dies at some point. Shocker, right? And everybody goes somewhere. There's only two places you can go. And so often one of the questions that comes up is, how can a good God send people to a place like hell? And, and what we're talking about right now is actually how that happens. Because if you're an enemy of God and you want nothing to do with him, then when you die, he's like, you want nothing to do with me. Here's the only place that you can ever go where you'll have nothing to do with me. That's what hell is. It is the absence of God. 
And so he says, hey, you don't like me? Cool. Here's what you asked for. He's honoring the wishes of every person. But if, you're, if your goal is, I'm going to submit to Jesus, then when you get there, the pearly gates or whatever it is, however you want to imagine that, because nobody really knows, you love my son, you want to be with me, here's where I am. Come over here. And the next person, I, I, don't, I didn't like you in, in life, and I don't like you in death. Cool, here's where I'm not. Go over there. So what you're actually looking at in this moment in Jonah is a, a playing out of eternity. You can follow God's way and you can go here and be with him forever. Or you can follow against God's way and you can row for no reason and it'll just be hard and the sea will push against you always and you'll just always suffer and it'll just be hard all the time. Because as an enemy of God, you don't hang with God. You don't, that doesn't make any sense. You row away from him. You push back against him. That's what enemies do. They don't like have dinner together. They don't hang out. And so what you're seeing as they, they row against themselves is, it, is life playing out, is man trying to kind of do his own thing. But there's a second way, and what I think is cool about looking at it God's way is you can see it really clearly if you translate the Hebrew literally, because what we read is not a literal translation. We, it, it gets modified by the translators to read a little better. So I made it a little more literal. Um, if you'll indulge me, literally the Hebrew says, the men nevertheless rowed hard to return to land but they couldn't because the sea grew tempestuous against them. And that's usually a word you use to describe people who are angry and, and like frustrated with you. But that's actually the word the Hebrew uses, and I think it gives a little bit of a, a better illustration of what's happening. The sea was angry that they weren't listening. Why does that make any sense at all to us? Well, I'll tell you why. You got a clue from it last week. When they asked him, who are you? Where do you come from? So if you've got the Bible open, go back a few verses to verse 9. I know this is last week. It's just a quick review. Verse 9, Jonah answers them. He says, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. So God is in and controlling and sustaining and working through all things. And so when man's plan was, heck with it, we're going this way, the sea responded because the sea, just like the heavens declare the glory of God and the, the sky proclaims the work of his hands, the sea worships God all the time because it's just part of his creation. And so the sea is like, weren't you paying attention? The sea gets angry. It grew tempestuous. It grew mad at them. It worked, look at the word in Hebrew, against them. Not it was difficult because the sea was rough. The sea itself was against them. You ever felt that way? Like your plan is just like, oh, this is the best thing I've ever come up with. And it just, nothing's working. And maybe it's not like a plan for something new you're doing in your life. Maybe it's just like, this is the road I'm taking to work this morning. And there's like every traffic light and every car that could possibly cut you off. You ever had one of those moments? Like, what is going on? Everything's against me. Thank you. He raises his hand and makes me feel like people are paying attention. I love that. Always from the children, right? When things are against you, there's a natural tendency to think it's you versus them. But what's interesting is what's happening in this moment is not God versus people. It is people saying, I don't like your plan. And God's saying, okay, you don't have to like my plan, but it's my plan, and because I win, this is going to be tough. So the sea grows tempestuous against them, and then there has to be, at some point, a slight shift. And so I want you to see, because God's way has been played out for us, I think, very clearly. Verse 12, which was right before we read today, verse 12, just as a reminder, pick me up, throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, because it will become calm. I know it's my fault the great storm has come upon you. So that's God's way, throw Jonah overboard. Then the next verse is man's way. We don't like killing people. We're just gonna, we're gonna handle it. And then verse 14, then they cried to who? Not to their gods, interesting shift, but to the Lord. They cried to the Lord, oh Lord, please don't let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, O oh Lord, have done as you 
pleased. And then what do they do? Well, they finally do what the Lord told them to. And look at the end of verse 15. The raging, or it uses actually in Hebrew, it's the same word again, the tempestuous sea grew calm. They got in line with what God was doing, and God said, cool, this is the easy route. Thanks for listening. Thanks for paying attention. You ever had that conversation with your kids? We can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. Does anybody else's voice get like raspy when they do that? You listen, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. A couple of you are laughing because it happens to you. I think it happens to me also. My kids are in the room. They're probably like, my dad is the lamest ever. It's true. But that's what God is doing. He's saying, listen, it's going to happen. Like, Jonah's going to go where I need him to go. And because you're stuck in the middle, you're either going to have an easy time giving him to me so I can do with I, what I need to, or you're going to have a hard time. But one way or another, my dude is going to my place to proclaim my name. That's what's happening, regardless. Like, he's going. And so they finally do the thing God's way, and God goes, awesome, here you go. I imagine like other places in the Bible where this situation could very easily have resolved. Like what if Moses was like, there's a lake there, we're not going to go that way, guys, we're going to go this way. Like what would God have done? Maybe he would have built a mountain in their way, I don't know. But Moses takes them where God says, and he gets to the, the sea, and there's a sea there, and he's like, well, this was maybe a bad idea but it was God's idea. And so he's just like, everybody's mad at Moses. Oh, we've come here to be killed. We could have just stayed in Egypt and been fine. And Moses is like, God is going to provide for us. And then God says, hey, bro, you're going to go straight through. Let me make a way for you. That's what's happening here. They finally are like, okay, overboard, row, guys. And God goes, you don't even have to row. I got you. I kind of imagine God like behind him, like just kind of shoving the boat along. And they're like, what's happening? You get in line and things just They don't necessarily actually become easier, but there's a sense in which the current is no longer against you. So there's man's way, and you can try that, and God will let you try it, or you can do it God's way, which I think he'd prefer, but he's fine with whatever because he loves you enough to let you stumble. And so with that in mind, then you come to verse 14 and 15, which we've looked at a little bit already, but this is when we shift from independence, which like everybody feels like that's a great word. And I know that like when we call Independence Day, like we, we're a country and we're independent and that's great. But individually, often that word gets us in a lot of trouble. Like typically parents who just love their kids will say, I have a strong independent child. And what they actually mean is the kid never listens. So like for the teenagers in the room, if your parents have ever described you that way, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. But what's cool is God describes every single one of us that way. These guys are just so independent. Bless their heart. It would be like if God was a little grandma. Bless their hearts. I just want to smack them. So, okay, they become obedient in verse 14 and 15, which just as a reference, they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. So they get, this is what we're doing but I really don't want to. This feels wrong, but this is what God said to us. And they say, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. So they just like, okay, we're going to listen because I don't know what on earth else to do. And so I want you to look at the two moments because the the words in Hebrew are almost identical. Back in verse five from two weeks ago, No, that was last week. Back in verse five from last week, each cried out to their own God, their Elohim, their little G. They all have their own like whoever's that they worship. Then they cried out again. Every word of this statement is different except one. They cried out to Yahweh, the I am, Jehovah, God, the Lord. They called out to Jonah's God, and everything changes. I'm not suggesting that, that we're all worshiping like little G gods on our daily lives, but maybe in some ways I am. It, we have a tendency to lean on things we have control over. So like, have you ever just had a moment where you're like, I'm not sure how I'm going to pay my bills. And the first thought you have is, you know, maybe I need a second job. What, like, okay, maybe you need a second job. But what if your first thought is I need to pray? I need to submit this challenge to the Lord and see what he's got for me. Maybe I have to live in this like world of poverty for a minute and learn some stuff. 
you get like your car breaks down. Okay, do I rush to like take out a loan that'll put me in debt that will make my family in jeopardy or do I need to just figure out a way to be a one car family for a little bit? What is God doing right now? How is he teaching me? These are like moments that God uses. They're unlikely vessels for leading us closer to a relationship with him, for helping us to learn what it looks like to submit to him. The sailors figured it out. This is the moment where they figure it out. They cry out, to God, hey, I am at my wit's end. It's your turn. I'm turning to you now, which is the moment that I had when I told you that story earlier. At some point, you just come to a place where you're like, all right, God, I don't, I don't know anymore. It's your turn. And so they submit to him. They cry out to him in the same way that they cry out to their gods. But this time, even though they've been crying out in probably the same way, now they're doing it to the right person. They're doing it in the right fashion with the right orientation and something different happens. That's the only word that's different. Elohim, the one on your, I guess that would be your left, and Yahweh on the right. It's the only thing they changed is the focus of their worship. If you're worshiping your income or you're worshiping your career or you're worshiping the car collection or the car or the, the size of your estate or you're worshiping your, your friend circle or you're worshiping the like, marriage that you have or the marriage that you want or the, whatever you're worshiping, and maybe you're not calling it that, but if it takes a place in your life that, that replaces the time you could be focusing and worshiping God, then I'm sorry, that's idolatry and you're worshiping that instead. And when you take that turn and you focus on God, There's a shift that happens. And so I think I've broken it down this way. Man's way, focusing on, you know, whatever, the things of this world, that's general worship. And then I would say the other side of that is specific worship. General obedience, specific obedience. And so maybe that makes sense and maybe it doesn't. And so I'm going to break it down. Elohim, the word in that first verse, it means little g God. It means capital G God. It has a a broad scope. It could mean a lot of things. It's very general. It's like, yeah, I'm worshiping. Capital G God is like Adonai or or Yahweh, or he's got like a bajillion names for himself. Those are all ways in which you worship specifically the God of the Bible. And it actually works itself out in some really cool different ways. And, And the way that I think makes the most sense for us in the story is general worship provides chaos. Specific worship provides safety. And if you keep that in mind, the fish starts to make a lot more sense because they're traveling across a very large sea. They're in the middle of nowhere and there's a really awful storm. And I don't know if you know this about being in the middle of the ocean, but it's like not the best place to be by yourself floating in the water. And so if you're worshiping just kind of whatever, life is probably very challenging. Things are probably coming up against you and you're probably like, I don't know what on earth to do. It's probably quite chaotic. But when you focus on God and what he has for your life. If you're reading his word and you're praying to him and you're orienting yourself towards God, and maybe you've never done that, and maybe today's the first day for you, but when that happens, there is a sense in which we are protected and we're safe from the storm. The Bible often describes God as having a mighty arm and an outstretched hand. And what if that mighty arm and outstretched hand was like over you while it was raining or between you and the enemy that's coming for you? What if that arm was on your side? Because it is, if your life belongs to Jesus. There's a power in that that we can live in or we can push against. But if he's got a mighty arm and an outstretched hand and you're on the opposite side of it, then you're probably struggling a little bit. There's probably a little bit of chaos in your life. And what if you just surrendered that and you were like, all right, I get it, it's fine. Another way we can maybe look at it is to look at John. So this is God's words, Jesus' words to us. In John 15, verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. That word can often be translated as abide, to stay in, to be present in. And there's a visual in the Hebrew um, that translates really well into the Greek. And so I'm going to paint it for you really quickly. The visual is a cave that you're inside, which, you know, we all live in houses. And so you're like, why is that a good thing? Here's why it's a good thing. When there aren't houses, all of the weather happens out there you're in here. Caves hold warmth really well. Caves can also be kind of drafty, so they're like the best of both worlds weather-wise, but they're protection from the elements, and there's only one way into a cave, which means if there's an enemy, you see them before they see you. 
That abiding is what Jesus invites us into. That's the safety of worshiping him specifically. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, is what Jesus says. And then he says, now, just stay there. Just be present. In the same way that animals will often leave their young, like in a safe spot to go hunting, because it's not safe for you in that craziness. So just stay. I'll be back. And so if you're obedient to him, instead of trying to be like independent and do your own thing, you'll listen, you'll stay, you'll be obedient. And what that leads to is a reverence for God that happens in verse 16. Look back at verse 16 with me. It says, at this... Remember, the sea grows calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. Well, we know, because we have the book of Psalms, which they didn't. It existed, but these guys weren't believers, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I guess the easy way to put this is, they finally started to get a clue, which would maybe make the Bible a little more fun to read. The men got a clue, and so they offered sacrifices to the Lord and made vows to him. So these are the two things they did. They figured out God, and so they started to do two things. They offered a sacrifice to and took vows to the Lord. Not to their, like, whoever's, but to the Lord. And so I want to do two things. I want to highlight offered a sacrifice, and I want to highlight took vows. Because these are the two things that they did. They went to church. They had church right on the boat. They did what we were doing. I want you to take note, though, of the fact that there's a red underline and a yellow circle, right? Remember those colors, because I'm going to show you another verse that comes out of the book of Acts in chapter 2. When the church gets started, this is a, a, a sermon, basically, that Peter gives. He says, it says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You see the yellow and the red? I'm going to go back. Offered a sacrifice and took vows. The sacrifice is red, the vows are in yellow. Now look at what Peter says it re- is required of you to be a believer, to be saved, to live in the safety that God offers. The vows are repent and be baptized. Or actually in Mark, Jesus says repent and believe. Baptism is a reflection of your belief. That's the vows you're taking. But what's awesome is, whereas in the Old Testament, we were responsible for making sacrifices, Jesus actually comes for us and he says, hey, I am the once for all sacrifice. I am what the entire Old Testament has been telling you to look forward to. Here it is, the one sacrifice. So they they offered a sacrifice and they took vows. They held church. Peter says, this is how we do what was happening then. This is how you do what was happening then. You give your life to him and you trust in his sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins, for the removal of the guilt that you carry. That's a really big deal, which leads us to the deliverance that it provides. Look at verse 17. This is the part everybody knows. The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights, which again, probably not a moment where they were like saved. The people probably looked and went, oh, well, there it is. See you later, Jonah. We got a shore to get to. Jonah was probably like, well, guess I earned this. But then actually, and we're going to get to this next week, all of chapter two is a prayer that Jonah has, the entire chapter. Because he's in the fish for three days and three nights, which is meant to tell us something. So Jesus gives us this exact story in the Gospel of Matthew, which I put on the screen. It says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus took the time to basically repeat this moment for us, which I think is important because it raises a really interesting question. Is Jonah allegorical? Like, is it just a story we we learn a lesson from? Or is it a testimony? Is it historical? Did it happen? Depending on how you were raised and 
what your parents believed and what your ministers at the time believed and, and the environment that you were in, you were probably taught one of those two things, and scholars will often debate one of those two things, and my encouragement to you is Jesus thought it was real. Jesus believed it happened. And so I think, and this is just me, we can fight on it if you want to, I think it is Jonah being really clear with us. This happened, and it was awful, but it happened because Jonah's testimony is important. Your testimony, my testimony, they're important, which is why I started today by sharing mine with you. That's, that's how I met Jesus. That's how Jonah got right with the Lord. And everybody has in their head somewhere a testimony of how they came to know that God was the Lord of their life. And I know that a lot of people in this room were born into Christian families. And my, my one like pushback on that is, you can be born into a Christian home, but you cannot be born a Christian. You do not come out of the womb going, Jesus, you don't do that. That's why Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, you have to be born again to enter the kingdom. You have to. And so whether you were born into a Christian home or not, there's a moment somewhere in your life, and maybe it's like me with a truck twice, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's like a period of time where you start to understand, hey, I think that there's something to this Jesus guy. And maybe that happened when you were like nine, or maybe it happened in your teen years, or maybe it happened towards the end of high school, or maybe like me, it happens in your 30s. I don't know. Maybe it happens the day that you're about to pass away. I don't know. It happens differently for everybody. But the value there is your testimony is the thing that people can't argue with. We live in a world where people love to say that that's it's just a fairy tale. But when the fairy tale happens to you, who's going to argue that? How, is that? how is that even remotely logical? It's not, because your testimony is your life. And so God says that thing, your life, is the way in which you're going to lead people to me. And so I think 100% of my heart believes that Jonah is an actual historical event, even though a giant fish doesn't eat a person and then not kill it. That makes just as much sense as a dude dying and then being raised three days later. I don't know if you know this or not, but that happened. Right? That's why we're all in this room, because Jesus died and then three days later was raised from the dead. And he uses this story to tell everyone it's going to happen. And so you can look at this and say, oh, Jonah's really neat. Teaches us about like loving God and following after him. Like You could do that. Or, hey, this is a story from someone in my family tree that got passed down to me so that I could know without a shadow of a doubt that God is real. And you should be confident enough to share your story about how God is real, just like Jonah was confident enough to share his story about God is real. And the cool thing, and you'll see this as we go because we've got a few more weeks in this book, Jonah, even after the fish was done with him and he gets spit up on land, is still not perfect. And so you might have a vessel like I have my tundra that like shocked me into faith, but that doesn't mean you've arrived. It just means you're walking in the right direction. And that should be so encouraging for you guys. You're walking in the right direction. Unless maybe you're not. Maybe you're in this room and you're like, I don't know if that's my life yet. I don't know if I'm following after him or I'm just, he's just an interesting you know, thing to learn about. And either way, that's okay. My invitation to you is like, wrestle with that. Maybe you need to commit your life to him this morning. Maybe you need to recommit your life to him this morning. Or maybe you're like on fire for Jesus in a way you've never been. And no matter where you find yourself in that spectrum, he loves you and he's ready. There are people here who are ready to talk to you when you get to that. I would love to be one of those people. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's your mom, or maybe it's one of the elders or one of the deacons, or maybe it's like some random website that you find all your research on, and then you just show up ready. I don't know. But whatever it is that you're going to do, my encouragement, God's talking to you, and he's ready when you are. And that testimony is powerful, and it's going to change lives. And so here's what I want you to remember Testimony matters. It matters, guys. And what do you do with that? So as we wrap up, what do you do with the testimony that matters? You remember what I called this sermon? An unlikely vessel for undeserved grace. Jonah had a fish. I had a truck. Jesus had a cross. That cross was supposed to be, and to this day is still, the worst way to kill a person. Like, if you want a person to suffer in unimaginable ways, it's not the electric chair, it's not lethal injection, it's not, like, gun violence, it's a cross. Because as violent as it is to be nailed to it, you don't die from being nailed to it. 
you slowly, over the course of hours or days, suffocate on the blood and fluid that slowly collects in your lungs. I'm not trying to be gross, I'm just letting you know. Sometimes the absolute worst thing that ever happened to you is the best thing that ever happened to you. I was really, really, really in a bad spot in my life. And I told you before, and I'll say it one more time just for the sake of those who weren't, weren't clear on it. I was maybe five minutes from divorce and probably not seeing my kids except on the weekends. I was also without a job, basically. I had one, but I couldn't do it. The worst possible part of my life was the springboard that God used to bring me here to make my marriage amazing, to restore my relationship with my kids. The worst possible moment in the life of man who never ever did anything wrong is the best thing that ever happened to you because that cross moment is the way in which you receive salvation. It's an unlikely vessel and it's undeserved grace and it's yours if you want it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing We thank you for what you've done, and we thank you for what has happened, is happening, is going to happen to each and every person in this room and everybody watching online and everybody for years to come who watches this. We thank you that you love us so much that you gave your only son, that for all of us who are listening to this, that if they believe in him, they will not perish but have eternal life. Because you did not come into this world to condemn it, you came to save it. And we thank you that because of that, we get to be your children, grafted into your family, covered by your blood. We thank you. We praise you in his amazing, spectacular name. Amen.